Kia ora tata. Ko pension o te wanga, ko wea te awa. Ko Jordi, toka iwi. Nau no dara mei hau. Ko Nigel Miller, toka ingoa. Nareva, tene koutou, tene koutou kata. Thank you, Barry, for that introduction. I'm Nigel Miller. Um, I'll try not to buy the spices by being a geriatrician, but it kind of comes into the picture. That's my mind. Um, and we're here to talk about having a primary and community strategy. So I'll just get started. Um, how do we do this? It's muted it again. Oh, I'll use the keyboard. Yeah. Stuck. Oh, we're off. Yeah, right. Um, and really, one of the one of the reasons for giving this talk today is to is to introduce the primary community strategy to the audience, particularly in the hospital and specialist services, because it has a relevance. Um, and what does it mean for you? Um, First of all, why do we need a, need a primary community strategy? Why do, we need a, why do we need a strategy? A strategy is not a list of actions, okay? If you have a strategy and a clear goal for where you want to be in the long run, it allows you to develop a series of actions, but it keeps you focused in the long run. You don't lose direction. You have an overall place you're going. And when opportunities arise and things change, you can respond to those opportunities because you don't know What's going to change the landscape in the next year? There may be something new come up, some new government funding, some new policy, some new opportunity. And if you have a strategy, you know how to respond to that. So that's particularly important, not just the actions we start with. It's the fact we've got a consistent set of goals that we're kind of signed up to. And it's, it, quite often, we get lost in today, lost in solving the problems that are in front of us, and we forget we need to solve them in a way that enables it to be sustainable for the future. And, it, and it's very difficult when you've got your head down trying to solve things. That you, if you lose, lose the track of where you're going, you're in difficulties. And that's a common problem in big organizations. So why a primary community strategy? Well, you could look at the health system. Sometimes it's looked this way. There's, there's kind of ends of the boat. And um, you, you've got no hope if you're in the end that isn't sinking because you're going down with it. So the whole balance is important that, that there, there's a vicious developing a health system and using a model is if the primary community health services start to struggle and can't meet the needs of people, then more people go to hospital. Then the hospital is struggling, so it needs more resources. In, in the current system, the way the DHBs are, are set up, the hospitals are magnetic when it comes to for resources. If you work in a hospital and you look to what happened in primary community services, quite often they're asked to cope with last year's money. That's the sort of thing that happens because it's contracted services, you can just write it in the contract. And so you can see a vicious thing can arise where, whereby the hospital needs more resources to keep doing this stuff so there's less available for the community so more people go to hospital and you can see where that's going to go. And that's the, one of the fundamental reasons we have to get this right because you know, the, bulk, the bulk of healthcare encounters by far happen well away from the hospital premises. And they, ha they ha happen to in a range of community providers and, and also in general practice. So we need a strategy to, so we know how to make to keep this show on the road, but do something creative. But expectations of people are changing. People want, on the whole, to take a greater interest in their own health care, to take decisions for themselves. Like me, my job description apparently says hypertension in the line. So I take the pills and measure my blood pressure. But that doesn't kind of fit with the current system at the moment. When I see my GP, you know, where do you want them uploaded? Doesn't kind of work. So, and, and this is a, a theme we'll see. And um, self-care is, is the option. So you, we know that people with diabetes can do an amazing amount for themselves. We know that the top of scope of practice for patients is home hemodialysis. So we have an opportunity there to help people take a greater role in their own healthcare. It doesn't work for everyone. We're not just handing, you know, say, oh, you get on your own. How do we do that as a partnership? And, and then we, we, we have a way of engaging with people, looking to the future and what's going to happen with technology. We, there's a big risk here that if a substantive body of the population engages in online healthcare 
um, with other new providers and we're not ready for it, that could severely undermine our primary care system, which I think is a fundamental part of our success as a health system in the world, because New Zealand's health system, although we see all its problems and all its warts, actually does comparatively well compared to other health systems in the world. And one of the foundations is primary care. And if we undermine, if that's undermined substantially, then we could get into real difficulty. Because if we take away the easy stuff, the, the low, you know, we could actually remove funding from primary care and leave them less able to do the more complex things, which are going to be the hardest things to do online anyway. So uh, those digital tools are coming our way. I haven't seen the answer yet, you know, the, the real killer application, but it's going to, somewhere it's going to pop up, you know. The iPhone or the, the, the Android, you know, the smartphone, it's only about 12 years ago. Only 12 years ago. So you can see how quickly things could change. And one would imagine they will change. Every other part of enterprise, apart from education and law, no disrespect, Barry, but haven't, you know, have caught up with this stuff and you expect to do it all online. It's a strange thing in health. We haven't quite come that, got to that yet. Our problems, you know, we've got, we've got inequities. Maori death rates three times what you'd expect if they weren't Maori. Um, in this part of the world, a lot of people in, res hospital, in residential care, despite the fact we provide a lot of community support services, doesn't seem to add up. Uh, there's older people in residential care which from my perspective as a geriatrician, I know that probably, we, we, well, I know we could do better on that. Um, more people come into ED, and I know it's, it's possible to level that off if we get it right. Um, a general practice workforce that might decline quite rapidly, and I, I met one of the young doctors in the hospital recently, he just proudly announced to me he's going to primary care, which I thought was great news. So he's asked me for a reference, so I'll be keen but we do need to keep recruiting into that workforce. Um, and our, our, our population is changing, 25% over 65. That doesn't worry me, actually. It's the over 85s that worry me, because over 65, you know, in 10 years' time, was, is actually going to not be, is going to be particularly young, because people are healthier, but it is that accumulation of people in the very old age group that could cause major problems for us if we carry on just doing things as the way we do them now. Um, if you look at these, these two graphs here, you can see the current model is, is where, where the money goes and therefore the effort, because money in health is only a proxy for people. Okay, because 80% of the money pays people just about, 70 or 80%. So where you look at money, it's not dollars, it's people doing work. And you can see that that's what's happening. We're, we're predominant, we have a big predominance of hospital and really, we want to work out what the opportunities are, what we can realize in terms of investing earlier, getting encounters and health care provided earlier in people's health course to avert some of that, to simplify things, um, and leave, leave us in a position where we're able to respond. Um, we do have this challenge coming off building a new hospital. And we should not build a new hospital in isolation of the rest of the health system. It's part of the health system. It's a tool for the health system to use. It's not an end in itself. And therefore, we have to have a, a strategy around the whole system, particularly the primary community part. How is it going to use a hospital? Not how do we supply it? How is it going to be used for patient care? Um, and so we've got, we've got to invest in, in the whole sector. And we, we could very easily be distracted by the demands of building which I think is probably the first whole hospital built in New Zealand for a long, long time, actually. So it could eat us if we don't have a clear focus and to, to hold to something around the really important part of the health system. So the strategy itself, um, it's focused obviously on our goals, better health, better lives, um, and empowering people to live well and stay well. Um, new ways of working, because we will have to change the way we work. And, we keep on saying that, we haven't quite done it yet. You know, if I went upstairs and did a ward round as a general physician, it's kind of rather similar to the one I did when I was a medical student, which is, you know, a while ago. So how are we going to actually work out how, what we need to change? Maybe we don't change that bit, but what can we change to make difference? How can we take advantage of technology? So we, if we have a strategy, we can be much more likely to be able to achieve that. Um, so number one, patients, consumers, far now, are empowered to drive and own their care. And I've given you the examples. If we can do it for home hemodialysis, we can do it for a lot of other things if we invest the time and energy in educating people. 
we want people, we want the service and the community to work close, more closely together in partnerships, and we'll, um, Doug will talk more about how that's to be done. Um, and we want a good integration across the hospital specialist services in the community. So we're lined up, so we know who's doing what. We can understand that we've got the health pathways put together. We really started to use them. And, and so people's journey becomes predictable and easy. I see a lot of unpredictable, unpredictability. But you can't tell what's going to happen next for patients quite often. We sort of get to the end of one bit and then do the next bit. So how can we make that a seamless, simple approach? And we also want to take, make best use of technology. As I've said, it, and that's a changing feast. We don't know what it's going to be. So I'll hand over to Doug now. He's going to talk more in detail about what's inside the strategy. And I'll come back at the end to round it up before we have some questions. Thank you. I uh, it's just a stock standard primary care physician in Dunedin, based uh, in the central city. Um, and the last time I spoke to Medical Graham Rounds was as a paediatric registrar about 20 years ago. Um, hopefully I'll do better today. Um, we've been uh, going through the strategy for quite some time, and uh, um, we have done a number of roadshows around the, around the region, um, uh, taking uh, our communities down the pathway, down the journey of what's happening in terms of the primary community strategy. And this lady here has been introduced by Chris Fleming as a lady called Margaret. Um, I'm not going to talk a huge amount about Margaret, but I just wanted you to, to see her picture and know what she looks like. Um, she's an elderly woman with multiple comorbidities, and anyone who's uh, practiced any form of medicine for a long time will have had a patient very similar to Margaret in their practice. And they'll be very aware of the difficulties that someone like Margaret has in negotiating the current health system, uh, right through from access to their primary care physician, managing their, um, their care, understanding their care. I've got... I've got Oh, it's not. It's your fault. <laughs> you, notice that, you notice that primary care always blames secondary care when there's a problem. Um, it's my heart. <laughs> it's your pacemaker. Um, uh, I've lost my track now. Um, and so, so um, this has been a way of explaining to patients who could quite quickly latch onto this and say, yeah, I've, just got to, I've either in this situation myself or I, um, I know of a person who's struggled with the health system. And we could start to say, well, compared to the current health system, this is what you'll experience. So uh, I'm only going to talk about the primary care part of the strategy, and I'll just come back, come back and talk about the secondary care response to the strategy, because it doesn't only involve changes in primary care for this to occur. So the first goal of the strategy is for, and I've, I've been quite strong in using the word patients um, rather than consumers, but to allow patients and their families and their communities um, to be empowered to uh, drive their own care. Now, there's a number of ways you can do that, and the model that we're looking at using is in front of you. So there's three key components that primary care will be looking to make changes in, and we're underway already in some of these. Um, the first is the model called the healthcare home. Now, this is not a new model. It's been developed in New Zealand um, over the last few years, about three years in, in uh, various places in the country. We're about to hit a million patients involved in healthcare homes around the country. So this, we're not the first people to do this, but we'll do it the best. Um, uh, so what does a healthcare home look like? Essentially it's a general practice, as you know now, but within that practice there will be changes that are made. Um, it's, it basically modernises general practice, uh, brings it to the modern era, it brings technology into, into play um, and opens up the whole practice to be much more patient focused and much more responsive to patient care. There's four key components. The first is uh, increasing access to urgent um, and uh, unplanned care for that patient who rings on the day currently and can't get an appointment with the GP and ends up in the emergency department with something that could have been com comfortably managed in primary care by any member of the primary care team. So this doesn't necessarily need to be managed by the GP. Um, and to do that, there are some changes that practices have to make to make appointments, uh, appointment availability, as well as um, increased GP phone triage, which is probably the biggest play in this space, as well as making sure that patients who ring for urgent appointments are seen if they need an urgent appointment, but if it's actually more that they just want their wind certificate done today instead of tomorrow, that they come at the appropriate time and see the appropriate person for that. Um, to create more space and, and capacity for urgent things, we have to think about the rest of the way we do the practice. So the second part of this is to think about um, proactive care for patients. We know patients like Margaret, who's gone from the screen, um, we know that patients like Margaret, uh, if we plan their care very well, then their need for care becomes less in terms of urgent or unplanned care or hospital level care. 
So if a patient like Margaret uh, has a care plan in place or advanced care planning if she needs it, um, then uh, that can be activated very quickly by providers at the right point of time and we can reduce her need for access to further services. So um, uh, we have a program about to, which has actually started up and running called the CLIC program uh, that's uh, uh, fully in this um, uh, care planning space for patients. Uh, the third part of this, I've got the order around the wrong way on my slide, is um, about uh, routine care for patients. So if we can improve uh, their access to unplanned and urgent care, we can plan their proactive care better, then we can increase capacity uh, for uh, just their routine care in the practice. And this involves thinking about things differently as well. As Nigel's commented before, if you have hypertension and you can do your blood pressure monitoring at home and you need some blood tests every now and then, um, do you need to go to your GP every three months for that? Is your GP the right person in the practice to provide that care? These are the questions that practices need to ask through this so that the patient is seen in the, at the, in the appropriate time, in the appropriate way to give them best access for care. Um, and the, th the fourth part of the healthcare home is business efficiency. So there are a lot of tools bring, coming in so that the business side of general practice can be run better. We know that there is a huge amount of inefficiency in every practice in the way we run our practices. What we don't know is how to stop it and how to change it and how to fix the leak in efficiency. We know if we improve efficiency, it'll, it should hopefully improve business profitability, but beyond that, it should improve access for patients to services. On top of this, patients, uh, and some of you who are patients, all of you will be patients, um, will have already noticed the uh, change in patient portals and access uh, to care through uh, uh, technology and a marked change in the whole patient portal space of what patients can do in terms of their own health literacy and in access to healthcare through electronic means. And surprisingly, we're starting to find that it's not just the young, trendy 18-year-old who can use that. Um, it's right up to the 80-year-old frail lady who wants to book an appointment online. Um, we, we had thought they would struggle. Um, so healthcare homes are underway. We've got expression of interest out right now. Um, we're waiting uh, for those to come in, and from 1 July, we'll start to um, work with the uh, first group of practices on moving them towards the healthcare home model. Um, big change for primary care, and it is going to take us some time, and we keep telling practices that they won't go to bed one night as a normal practice and wake up on the next day as a healthcare home. Um, there is a process to work through for all the practices. And the same with the entire um, community and uh, primary strategy is it's going to take some time to get there. Um, and hopefully Nigel's boat will, will just keep bailing that out until we get, get to the point. Uh, the second stage of the primary community strategy is a thing called the community hub. It's not specifically clear to anyone as far as I can tell exactly what a community healthcare hub uh, looks like. Um, but I've got, I've got some slides in my over there. This is the structure. Um, so a community, uh, the, a community hub will probably almost certainly contain a general practice within it, uh, but not all general practices will be community hubs. So they will be uh, a place where a group of general practices um, and other uh, members of the primary care team. So remember, general practice is not the only primary care provider in our community. Um, and there are lots right through this area who would be in the primary care space. And, and there may be more as time goes on, as we realise that some of what's provided in secondary care may not need, it, need to actually be provided in secondary care going forwards. Some of, some of these services will then need to be provided in a, a hub, which almost certainly will be a physical location, a building, uh, where uh, a wider range of services are provided than they're currently provided in a standard general practice at the moment. Now, there are some practices already doing this. Um, to a certain extent. So we've got a little bit, not just, uh, we've got them in the southern region, uh, but we've also seen them uh, around the country. So we know a little bit how this model works, but sp specifically what a hub will look like or be like will be quite specific to the location and the services that are required in that location. So there's a little bit of work to do around the hub side of things. Um, but, uh, and the, the uh, primary care physicians and the primary care team will feed into that hub um, and be part of that loop. Um, outside of that, there's this thing called locality networks. And locality networks, um, this is a bit of a map uh, that uh, is a little bit of a, so far, just a, a speculative approach of what a locality uh, network distribution might be like. Now, if you're uh, from any one of these areas, especially in some of our rural spaces, and you're looking at that and thinking, I don't think my town fits into that correctly, you're probably right. So we're still working this through at the moment, and there's potential changes to this. So I don't want you to photograph that slide and take it to ODT and say, these guys are putting a locality network right here, and I don't agree, because that's, this is really just, um, just to give you an idea of what a locality network would look like. 
Um, so locality networks are geographical locations that um, uh, look across the services required for that locality and say, what does our primary healthcare look like in this locality? And we are pretty confident that the services and the structure and things that are provided in one of these localities may be different to the services that need to provide in a different locality. If you've got a very big box hospital in one locality and no hospital in another locality, your services will probably be slightly different. Um, having said that, we're going to get a new hospital and things will look different in that hospital and we need to think about what services are currently provided in the big hospital now that may be provided in the hub structure in the future. So they are linked to some extent. Um, so coming back to Margaret, what does it mean? Um, so if, remember, I've just given you the big structure on what we're talking about from a primary care perspective. For a patient, it means in some instances very little. So for a patient who's currently well with no significant medical problems or attends their GP every three years just to say hello because they've got a cold, um, life may not be hugely different, but hopefully they'll be able to see their GP the same day at least, um, which they may not do now. We were dealing with a practice up north recently, they had a 28 day wait to see their GP. Um, so uh, fortunately my practice sees people on the same day. Um, so come to us. Um, <laughs> it's my little bit of advertising. <laughs> um, but it does mean that uh, the patient care will now be more centered on what Margaret needs. So um, for a patient who has significant medical illnesses um, and significant needs, her care will be more proactive. Um, she will have a care plan in place, she'll know what to do when things go wrong. The providers also will know what to do when things aren't going well and um, every part of the illness that can be managed uh, proactively will be. Um, hopefully it means fewer tests and assessments. Anyone who's worked in the medical field for a long time will know that doctors always for some reason do say the same tests four hours later that the GP did four hours before because for some reason they don't believe that when we took the box it was different to when the specialist took the box. Um, and so it has improved with Health Connect Health and Health One, so the access to results is better. But um, hopefully uh, there'll be less time because the notes and everything will be more accessible and more shared. Um, she'll be able to access her primary care team in different ways. She'll, she'll be able to access um, both through visiting, but also through email and um, also through phone access, although phones are becoming increasingly outdated as time goes on. Um, but she should have better access, maybe different access, but better access. Um, we hope that her care, will, that as it's required, will be able to provide closer to home. She won't have to come to the big box hospital as often. Um, and uh, she'll see people that she's much more familiar with and able to talk to without having to tell her story for the 18th time because the registrars have just changed for the year. Um, hopefully this will give her an increased level of confidence in the primary care service, but also uh, through access to technology, which is um, uh, provided through the primary care model, um, so she can get reliable access to online uh, resources. Um, she can get support groups, she can get access to community-based care providers, more access to a wider range of services that allow her to manage her care uh, more easily. Now, um, I'm going to hand over in a moment, but um, that sounds a bit scary for and some of the roadshows that sound a little bit scary for some of our elderly patients um, who are like, well, I just want it done like, I, like, like it will be. For those patients who don't want to do this, the life can go on as it is. Um, and they, we're not going to force people into having to make all their appointments online or do everything technologically. Uh, but for patients who are willing to take this on, they will get a much, um, they will get much better access to all these services. Um, and I think for them, it's going to make a, a, a vast difference to their care. Thank you, Doug. Can you hear me all right? Right, it will come on in a minute. I'll just talk loud in the meantime. Look, um, what does this mean for specialist services? Well, one of the focuses is for the specialist services to be available when they're needed. So we have capacity to respond at the time it's needed rather than queuing and getting to complexity. There's two parts to that. The one, one part is the demand, it's getting the right people to us. The second is what are we gonna do about our systems? And I, I see, I observe just going around the place and dealing with lots of things that we have a lot of variation in the way we do things. Uh, the patient flow is never entirely visible and clear. Um, and it's really quite complex sometimes. Lots of things happening in the background. Lots of people having to remember things are done. Bits of paper going back and forwards. So we have to be able to straighten that out. Get some sort of focus on a, on a, on a, a more standardized approach to things. 
um, using health pathways to get the clinical bit right, but to get the, the infrastructure, the transactional systems all working smoothly. Um, and then to work out how we do that so it's visible and we're in partnership with primary care team, with general practitioners and with community services, so they also can see what's happening. Um, focus and focus on improving care for older people that we have to undertake in the hospital services. So you've probably seen the thing called NPJ paralysis. If you haven't, I would encourage you to look at it. it sounds very trendy. What does it mean? It means that older people shouldn't be in bed in hospital. It's as simple as that. If they're in bed, they're getting worse. Sometimes people need a bed in hospital. It's actually quite limited. Obviously, you need one in intensive care. So sick, you can't get out of bed. That's not everyone in hospital. It's probably a small portion, and you need one to sleep in. Otherwise, we need to start changing our way of looking at enablement in hospital. Um, so we have a hospital that can meet the demand for acute things and also specialist services, things that can't be done anywhere else. And that's what we, we should be focusing on. You think, when you look at a strategy like this, you might think it's a bit ambitious, you know. We just, you know, it's a pie in the sky. Well, you, people here will have heard of the Cleveland Clinic in the States, one of, one of the most successful heart institutes. It maybe does a bit too much heart stuff, that's another story. But one of the most successful institutes, they, they started with, a, with, with, with this sort of belief of, of what they call appreciative inquiry, which was looking at their successes. And their successes, they have lots of things. We've got successes. We have great primary care great general practitioners, we have great hospital specialists and services, we have really good um, uh, environment to work in, and some great community services. How do we take advantage of that? In order, and the priest inquiry model is you look at what you're doing well, and then you start having some big dreams. And then you, and you focus on those, and you hold to those, and you think that's too ambitious, but that's what enabled the Cleveland Clinic to be successful, and lots of other institutions have used a similar model. So the idea of thinking, you know, to substantially change things is valid and well worthwhile in the health system. Um, we do need this, this technology infrastructure, and I won't wax on too much, but I can see substantive changes from my perspective. Every patient should be able, be able to read their whole health record. I don't see why they can't. I can't see the obstruction. You know, it's, it's the last private thing left, you know. They can read the medical textbook, which they couldn't do a few years ago. But why, can, why can't I read my own record? I can't find a good reason why I can't read my own record. Um, and if you haven't started realizing that, you should start realizing that, start writing stuff for the patient to read. A very wise physician said that to me as a medical student. I should always make sure you write for the patient to read, which I've always done. You need to be in that frame. Um, the technology, will build technology into the new hospital. Lots of exciting opportunities. We tend to be frustrated by today's technology. If we could deliver today's standard of technology, in 10 years' time in the hospital, we'd be a long way further forward. So was in 10 years' time, if we delivered what was ten, good 10 years ago, we'd be miles ahead of where we are now. But I think we can do even better than that to join things up. And it gets easier every day to do it technically. It's just a matter of commitment. Um, so we've got to then start about how we're going to shape our secondary care response to work with this. How can we find ways to partner with primary care to coordinate the follow-up of patients when we know what needs to be done on a regular basis rather than having to come back to the clinic and we can see what's done on a regular basis using technology. Um, so there are things to do. To me, this is really exciting to have a coordinated way forward. Um, so as, as Doug, Doug indicated, they're, 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 we're having expressions of interest around healthcare homes, um, <coughs> consultations around how the localities are put together. I don't think they'll have boundaries. I think there will be general areas because when you say boundary, someone will draw a line down the middle of the street. We don't want that. We want a general principle and flexibility. Um, and more needs analysis. We, we, we struggle in New Zealand with health needs analysis to really know what the needs of people are. It's quite hard to do, because how do you find out what people's health needs are until they actually access a healthcare service? That's a healthcare service assessment. We need a health needs assessment. If we, we can do more on that. Um, and local work about how to organize services. When we've been around talking about this to local areas, they really do have a good understanding of how they could shape things much better. And they're caught up in the way we think should be, things should be done in a sort of centralist view. And they've got much better ideas than we have. And this is about actually helping people actually undertake and execute their ideas because they know what their local community is like. We don't know. Um, making sure we get those models of care right in Dunedin Hospital I talked about. 
Um, Health Pathways, I think, is a really important tool for two reasons. Secondly, because it gives us a health pathway we can follow and, and see what clinically should happen. But firstly, the development of health pathways should be a communication between the hospital and special services and primary care. And that communication creates team. If you spend time with people, you understand their perspective and the other bits you don't know about. Um, because I don't know the details of working in primary care. And so I have to listen to people who do that every day. Um, and we'll, we want to continually review and evaluate what we're doing. So we're, we're, I think we're in a really exciting time. Um, we do want feedback, um, continuous feedback, not you know, sort of mammoth dates where things have to be in by, but continuous feedback. And we want, where we want to redesign things, we want to make this what's co-designed. Sounds a trendy word. What it really means is the people involved are in the room, and that's everyone, and that includes the patients. Um, and that's really important. So if you think about redesigning a service, I know those services that are successful have done this, but get the patients in the room and you'll find you've got a wise group that give you a new perspective. Um, that's what the strategy is. We'll happily answer questions or anything you like. So there'll be the three of us, Doug, and these are myself, won't we, at the front here. And I have a microphone here for anyone who wants to ask a question. <coughs> Can I just ask this question and then you know, um, the question? Um, when are we going to have a common? <laughs> well, I'll answer a different question. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you about the strategy for the National Electronic Health Record, which is not to give you an application that you log into, but to develop a, a shared data set that will be live for people. So my data will be available in a shared data set that's a substrate, and if I agree, it's freely available at every point of care to be used by the applications you already have, okay? So all my blood pressures are in one place, and then if your system in, in the general practice wants to look at blood pressures, it looks at my blood pressures from that. So we have one source of the truth, which of course is the most fundamental part of integrating. When we will have shared care plans? Well, we do have in Health Connect South now the technology to put together shared care plans, which is already happening in some parts of the South Island. So I, I hope this year we'll be able to start putting some stuff together. Well, you're, you're, this is Kyle Ford from Well South, who's a, a real IT expert, not, not someone like amateur like me. And there's two parts to that. There's sort of the acute care plans for people who are currently need acute care, which is a, who we want to target. And the second one is what's called advanced care plans, which means care plans for your sort of end of life stuff. Um, and then people are able to work with them on their primary care practitioner. They'll get uploaded into the system and be available at every point of care. Great, well, it's happening um, already. Patients with COPD with Stuart. Is Stuart here? Yeah, Stuart, good. Yeah, Jack and I are looking at each other and saying, aren't we doing that? Um, so, yes, we are doing it. And, and I don't know if I talked with Jack, but. Uh, 
hospital and the primary care system, I think, and even within the hospital, from people I know who've worked on, on these projects. So if I move to Waitemata, for example, does my electronic record easily transfer to their system? Uh, no. No. So what happens then? Well, I, I, as I, I've said to the team who have been working on, on the model of the shared record we've got across the whole South Island, the whole South Island is covered, is we've got to get the landing craft organized to invade the North Island, really. Um, part of it will happen through that shared data set, so your data will become available to Waitemata. Not happening yet. Part of it will happen because why I'm actually working with the, the Auckland region, how they're going to structure themselves, and we'll definitely make sure we get a connection between the two. But it's not happening right now, You'll, and I'm very frustrated by that. Um, I just wanted, I think, to perhaps reflect a bit on some of the, I think, key conceptual drivers or indeed delivery drivers for what you're doing. I've asked a question around that. One of the key drivers for what we're doing here, regionally, internationally, is multi mobility. Okay, that was implicit in a lot of what you were saying. Okay, a lot of what you were saying was about multi mobility as it applies to older people, and that's clearly a need to address. But we are. I think increasingly going to have to focus on multi mobility across the life cycle. Multi mobility affects people in deprived areas younger, and in particular, physical and mental health comorbidity is an increasing problem in younger groups. And I think that, I think, is, is a springboard to my question, really, which is that linking what I've just said conceptually with policy developments here, clearly, mental health and primary care are both very high on the agenda for this government. So my question really is, is, can you say anything about, about how you intend to use this model specifically to improve and integrate mental health services, particularly within primary care? I suspect that is probably an area that we'll need to look at, particularly in the context of mental mobility. I've got a better answer than I do, Tim. Um, <laughs> Um, I, I think the first part, of, first part of your question is about, um, is this just for the elderly? Um, but the, uh, what we use in terms of um, the proactive care is a stratification model. So essentially you stratify your patients, regardless of age, for their comorbidities and give them a, essentially a, a number that says this person's high risk versus this person is, is low risk and then you provide care to a patient at the, in the high-risk group, and that's regardless of age. But of course, if you're older, your, high ri your risk goes up because of age alone. Um, so in terms of just straight, you know, who is this for? Anybody who's, who's high risk or high needs um, would fit into that scope. In terms of the mental health side of things, that's a, that's a space that's not clearly um, elicited in the strategy as a, as a specific space. Um, but it's, we would agree with you, and, and the government's clearly got that, and, and going through a, a mental health review at the moment at government level to, to assess that. It's, and it's clear that um, not, nationwide we're not doing well enough in the mental health space, um, and uh, we need to look at where that care is provided. Is it in the community? Is it, within, is, it best, is it well provided in the secondary care service at the moment? what can be provided in the primary care service, what can be provided outside of general practice in the community, and therefore how do we fund it. Um, and that process is, is ongoing, but the, the basic model and structure that we have in the primary community strategy allows us to tweak into that appropriate spaces. Yeah, I'd, I'd say the, the risk, the, the challenge of mental health is where, where it becomes expert and parallel primary care, you get this gulf. So people are getting maybe expert mental health care and expert primary health care, but they're not joined up. So, however, that if you look at the networking structure, the localities and the hubs, there's every opportunity to bring that together as part of our response to the mental health review. So we've designed, I think, the right substrate. I understand that, but if you have to look at the needs of patients, in particular some research we've done with the summer student and high needs practices, the, 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 the amount of mental health and physical comorbidity in patients is extremely high, and we need to have the services that the patients need, not necessarily, I think, rely on existing, necessarily think that existing ways we configure those services is important. And that is very much the emphasis of some research I've done here with colleagues and much mobility, we need service redesign.
have a degree entirely, and we need to bring that research into our planning. Yeah, I think I think Tim, you've you've made a really good point. Um, and mental health, in some ways, sits outside of the side of the stratification. And I think you know, particularly around adolescence, where we're seeing a, you know a big increase in mental health. Then I, I think that we, we certainly need to have a lot more communication between the mental health services and primary care. I think that's pretty fundamental. Um, and looking at different models of how adolescents ac actually access care for mental health is important. Um, so I think it, it doesn't quite fit in this strategy to some extent, but I think the empowerment of practices, understanding their mental health issues amongst their population, I think this, this format gives the, 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 the methodology, if you like, for influencing that, that communication with primary and secondary services in mental health. Well, I was just going to uh, make the comment that um, there is no health without mental health and well-being, and uh, this is a fantastic opportunity to reconnect physical health and mental health um, because uh, so much, if you have physical comorbidities, how well you manage that is um, really strongly influenced by your mental health um, or you know lack of mental health. So to separate them as a to me a nonsense and we must put them back together again. And it's easy, much easier to do that in the primary care space and the challenges with how physical health and um, mental health at, at the secondary level integrates into what's happening in primary care. So um, currently in primary care, obviously, a, a doctor is paid to see a patient for 15 minutes. Now, somebody who has a mental health issue, as well as all the other things that is going on with them, 15 minutes is woefully inadequate to see them. So this whole process is designed to free up capacity and time within general practice so that you're using the whole team rather than focusing on one member of the team to generate the revenue to keep the business going. So I think that's possible. I think that's one of the really key things. I talked to a GP a few months ago and she said, what about my, um, you know, I have patients who come in here, they're from South D, they, they've taken a long time to get comfortable coming to see me, and when they come and see me, they want to spend half an hour now that means I slow down for everybody else who comes to see me. So how can I free up my time to see those sorts of patients? And that's what this model, um, that's the experience elsewhere in New Zealand, and that's what we're hoping to do, um, which is to, well, is to give more to the patients and to, and to free the, the practice from the tyranny of the 15 minute consultation. Thank you. Question through that. Um, just to recover this question, because um, how does it address the problems with access Okay, it, it, it doesn't directly influence the sort of surgical protocol, <coughs> then it might work on the margins where we can support primary care to provide office based procedures. You know, we, we can have trained uh, general practitioners in the hubs to do things if we want, but not for the, the, the serious disorders. How does it help? Well, if we can manage the overall use of the hospital for acute services for older people and, and stem the growth, we've got capacity. Because, well, it, so let me finish. It, it doesn't give you new theaters, I agree, okay? We've got to build a new hospital for that or find alternatives in the meantime. When I say you've got capacity, we have to then reshuffle our workforce because in the hospital, resource is people, you know, along with the, uh, important issues like theatres. This strategy in itself will not give you new theatres, but it does give us opportunities for the future, because if we leave things as they are, we'll be more in more and more difficulties. It gives us an opportunity to reshape ourselves to deal with this, and also to get a better understanding, a better relationship in primary care about the needs of those people that we don't even get to see, um, that we all hear about. We're not quite sure what, how we're going to meet their needs. We'll have a better, a better relationship, better data, better understanding. So it doesn't solve the problem but it gives us some opportunities to address it. I think, um, yeah, I think that's partly true. But I, I think, uh, look, if you need to hip replace and you can't walk and you're almost in a wheelchair, you're going to need that done in a secondary care hospital, whatever. And, and this is a primary community strategy, so it's not trying to fix that, that problem. And you may well need a secondary care access to elective surgery strategy to solve that problem. But I think if you said to yourself, what percentage of patients turn up on my outpatient first specialist appointment clinic that don't really need to be seen by me? 
and uh, then maybe that's a space we can work in. So if 80% of your patients don't go on to have surgery and they should never have got there, then this strategy can be in that space to improve at least that level of access. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, we, you'll know yourself, but you know, we know that patients who get good physiotherapy in the community with their hip osteoarthritis may well delay their surgery quite significantly. Um, so potentially that uh, moves the, the um, bottleneck a little bit. Um, I'd just like to highlight um, the need uh, to revise and revisit things on a regular basis so we know we're heading in the right direction and we know that we're achieving what we're actually trying to achieve. So I think alongside the use of technology, we actually have to recreate some of the data that we collect to actually um, critically evaluate what we're doing because I think traditionally in the health sector, the data sets have all been um, isolated in particular silos and everything. So. I think alongside um, this particular strategy, we need to actually um, reevaluate what particular data we collect and um, uh, for the success of this. And I just wanted to highlight um, the plight possibly of those that aren't actually um, involved in general practice. And I think they are a significant number within our community. And, um, and I think probably they are, they are possibly the most socially disadvantaged of our population and actually probably contains some of the most severe comorbidity. I'll just comment on that. Um, data is um, critically important. And we have a lot of data, we just don't work out how to use it best. So if we have a strategy and we hold to the goals, we'll begin to, because quite often, you know, people put strategies on the shelf. We want this to be a strategy where we hold to the goals and then, and then we can use data we've got the best data for managing healthcare systems is the data that's collected in the process of care, because that's the most accurate and timely data. So our goal will be to use that as best we can. And as we develop that, that shared data set, along with um, primary community, and Carl and I have had discussions about how to do that, then we can get a much better visibility of, of how well we're doing, or otherwise where the problems and issues are. And we can also find our successes, because I know in this sort of endeavor, if we find success, and, and can make it known and realize we can achieve things, it creates um, the opportunity for more because you less people lose heart and more people think actually something can improve. clinical engagement and, and leadership that they've shown um, to date. Uh, just to please get, stay involved, get involved. Um, this is now a system-wide uh, approach really and, and is really the vehicle for integration across our system. So uh, please don't be um, you know, kind of fooled into thinking that this is just about primary and community because absolutely, uh, as the boat showed in Nigel's slide, we need to row this boat together. Um, so just, yeah, thanks for your interest really and, and delighted with how it's gone. I want to say formally thank you to the speaker, Dr. Smith, for the fascinating session.